Welcome to ReachMD. You are listening to Lipid Luminations, produced in partnership with the National Lipid Association and supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. Your host is Dr. Alan Brown, Director of the Division of Cardiology at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital and Director of Midwest Heart Disease Prevention Center at Midwest Heart Specialists at Advocate Healthcare. You're listening to ReachMD, and this is Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown, and with me today is nurse practitioner Joyce Ross, who just at this meeting became president of the National Lipid Association. She's also a consultative education specialist in the cardiovascular risk intervention with the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Joyce, I know that today we're going to focus on the obesity epidemic, but uh, I think it's a testimonial to what a great organization the NLA is that uh, as a nurse practitioner who has participated on almost every committee and been a very active member of the national board uh, that you've been recognized and that, this, that it's a type of organization where uh, a, quote, non-physician can become president. And I just uh, I think obviously you'll be a fantastic president, but uh, I just wanted to say how happy I am that uh, you're in that position. Thank you, Alan. And I think that the um, reality that, yes, I'm a nurse practitioner, the first time that we've had a nurse practitioner president at NLA, but we've always also had pharmacists, we've had nutritionists, and this is the only organization I know where you can come right to the top because we all respect each other's abilities. We have different agendas sometimes, but we definitely have a patient in mind. So it is a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, and I think it enriches what we do because we do have different agendas. And uh, many times you bring us physicians back to remembering other things that are very important in the care of patients that may not be in our wheelhouse and should be, and probably vice versa, right? Absolutely. I think the benefit of being a nurse practitioner uh, is that I'm uh, halfway into the medical world and the other side into the nursing world. And bringing those two agendas together really allows for a patient-centered care. And, of course, that's what we're all striving for. And I do think that um, physicians look at the world sometimes differently, not so much at the NLA because we are looking at prevention and we're looking at the same thing. But in a lot of ways, I think physicians have been trained historically to take care of things once they're problems. And we as nurses have always been the other side. You know, let's prevent it. So put it all together, and we've got a great combination here at the NLA. Uh, Before we get started on the obesity discussion, I think maybe the listeners would be interested to hear what your goals are for this year as president. Um, Obviously, I realize that a lot of our audience are not lipidologists and not necessarily members of the NLA, though you're all invited to join. But uh, they'd probably be interested to hear from your vantage point what you want to accomplish this year. Yes, thank you for asking that, Alan. I I actually have a very interesting kind of an agenda, and mine is to be a disruptor. And uh, we at the NLA have had uh, an opportunity over the last few years to really change our face in the lipid world. With our part one and part two recommendations, we have really planted our feet firm and said, this is the place to come for your lipids. And I want to uh, continue that disruption that uh, we're not specialists, but really, really work toward internally as well as externally being disruptive of ideas that may be incorrect, like maybe certain things are for physicians and certain things are for the others. We are together. So that definitely is one of the things that are very, very important to me. The other thing is to be outside of our organization and include other organizations. So many other like-minded groups um, really need to know more about lipids, and we want to invite them to be part of us. We realize they may not want to be members of the NLA, but they certainly could benefit from the education pieces and the work that we do. So we really want to get out there and say, come on, talk to us and tell us what you need, particularly women's health issues, um, issues with uh, OBGYNs, because I think that they are the beginning for getting lipids tested. I think rheumatologists, all the folks that we deal with in our own lives would benefit from some of the information we have, and we want to share. Well, that's terrific. I'm looking forward to next year under your leadership. So uh, our discussion today, as you know, is going to focus on the obesity epidemic and what the clinician needs to know. This is a tough topic because, as I've joked about many times in the past, the problem with willpower is it has a half-life of two weeks and it's soluble in alcohol. And I was just (laughs) reading today, you know, why people give up on diets and uh, people fighting weight loss and 
the data being a little bit discouraging on being able to maintain it. So uh, I wonder if you could tell me, first of all, a little bit of the scope of the problem, which I think we're all aware that obesity is an increasing area of concern, significantly increased. But tell us what the real scope of the problem is, and then we'll get into the discussion of how we may tackle it. Yeah, the real scope of the problem, this is an epidemic that is not only in the United States any longer, but actually is, is pervasive around the world. The epidemic is based upon our lifestyle more than anything else. I really believe that the fact that we are in such a computer generation where families uh, don't get outside, don't walk. They sit home at night and play on their, their machines. I always think it's uh, incredibly funny when you see a commercial where four family members are sitting together in a living room and each one is on their own machine and not talking to each other. Same thing as we don't go outside. We, we don't get out and we don't exercise. Children don't go out and play like they used to because they play in the house by themselves or reaching a friend. I think that this epidemic is because we also have such good food here. We have good food and we think that more is better sometimes. And when we want to change, it's not only from the patient perspective or the person, because I do believe people want to change, but they read the wrong thing sometimes. You know, if you stay up late at night and you get on those channels where there's four or five weight loss things that are going to change you in two weeks, you're going to be in a bikini. And, uh, you know, it's just not reasonable. But people, because they don't understand or know what to do, will reach out for anything. They'll take medications. They'll do all sorts of things. And these fad diets can be very unhealthy. So I think that, uh, you know, it's a big problem for them. But then as a provider, when your patient comes to you and says, I've tried all these diets, I don't know what to do. But what I believe strongly is that the providers don't necessarily know what to do either. And I think that just the um, acceptance of that, that, you know, we really don't know all the answers, is, is the catalyst for change. And so what we have done here at NLA for a workshop at this meeting was have a group of people sit down and talk about this epi epidemic and how over 50% of our population is overweight or obese at this time. And for the first time in our history, we have children with type 2 diabetes. So it's a marker for what's going on. Scary, though is when I've talked to people who are really obese. And when they compare how they've lived in misery, feeling like they've been not able to get a job, they have been discriminated with, they said, some people say, I'd rather be blind than obese. So I don't think we've taken it that seriously. So as providers, we read the same things. We see the same commercials, but we don't know. So what we've done is we put a little workshop together that we discuss the guidelines for obesity or the guidelines that are the newest one for weight management. And because that's what it really is. It's not diet, it's management. And uh, then we actually showed people how to get to talk to patients about this because I think that's what we need to know. How do I do it? I might know the information, but I don't know what to do. Same way with the uh, changing of behavior. And so we were changing behavior by doing adherence and physical activity. So let me ask you about that. I, first of all, I know the NLA has a couple of documents on obesity. I'm not sure if the second one is out yet, but the, the part one mm -hmm. uh, with, that was a joint effort between the NLA and the Obesity Society right. was certainly a, a great accomplishment. Do, do you think that, uh, I mean, since 1950, we have about five times the number of diabetics. It's pretty striking. And, and I wonder sometimes whether our recommendations to reduce fat in the diet from the American Heart Association going back many years prompted everybody to read the labels and say, okay, there's no fat in these no-fat cookies. <laughs> so they ended up filling in with carbohydrates and sugars. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there was just this gigantic ramp up. And, and the second thing I think is we're victims of the uh, – the post 9-11 generation and uh, our worries about our children. So when I was a kid, my mother would always say, you can go to your friend's house even at 9 o'clock at night. You can ride your bike across town. Mm -hmm. um, just be back in time to get to bed by 1030. Mm -hmm. uh, now we wouldn't even dream of doing that, right? So maybe we're happy that our kids are sitting in the basement playing video games. <laughs> so it's hard to know whose fault it all is, but what do you think about the uh, dietary recommendations and their changes? I, I think that what happens with um, diet, of course, is that people, um, they, they, they don't listen, they don't read the guidelines. We're the ones who read the guidelines. We're the ones who are the suggestors of what we should be doing. 
many, many people never see us for that problem until they have a really large problem. So I think guidelines are wonderful, and I think uh, giving us ways of, to apply those guidelines is fabulous. I think our real problem comes from getting the folks in front of us so we can really, you know, do the magic. But, you know, you talk about the uh, children not playing outside. It's so true. But while they're sitting there playing their, their games, they're also munching on potato chips. Right. And so that's the, the ideology of, of this major, major problem. And, um, you know, you go to an airplane and they have extensions for people. You go to uh, a ballpark and a few ballparks have now changed their seating. You go to an airport to get on a plane. They've got wheelchairs that are one and a half sizes to fit the population. So maybe we've just taken on an attitude of, well, I guess it's okay. And, of course, it's not. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and I'm with nurse practitioner and, and the new president of the National Lipid Association, Joyce Ross. Uh, she's a consultative education specialist in cardiovascular risk intervention. So, Joyce, you didn't tell me. I, I let you skirt that one question about whether the reducing fat and, and the carbohydrates, uh, whether we've actually added to the problem, whether organized medicine maybe had given a little bit of the wrong advice since instead of focusing on, you know, a little more protein and reducing saturated fat. Uh, but I, I'd be real curious what your thoughts are. I think that the guidelines came along and told us not to eat so much fat, but they didn't tell us to substitute it with carbohydrate. Right. But what people heard and what manufacturers of food heard was, let's say, no fat. So we'll add something else. It's like taking the salt out of something. I'll add something else that's, that's equally as bad or taking sugar out. I, I think that the, um, the, the people who provide health have good intention, but I do think that our, our patients out there do not understand at all. They just hear low carb, no carb. And then, of course, we've had a few books that were written about, you know, the uh, no-carb diets and the high-protein diets and all those other diets. I mean, you know, they all start with D-I-E. And mm -hmm. I think there are things to avoid. And uh, so I think that it's been a totally, you're, you're right, that people just went all different ways because they didn't understand. But today, I think we have the ability to um, teach people a little bit better. Maybe we should use those computers a little more for education and not so much for the, uh, for the use of just having entertainment. Yeah, and I think simple messages are the way you educate, right? And if you look across all the diets, it's really determined by calories, whether you get a result. That's right. No matter how you get those calories, it's total <laughs> calories. Calories in and calories out. <laughs> right. And so all the, that's one thing that we haven't probably done a good job of having simple messages. Right. You just need to restrict calories. And you will lose weight. And I have a lot of patients that think they have some disease where they are not eating anything and they don't lose weight. And yeah. I explain to them that doesn't happen. There's no. No, no such disease. We have a method that's called simple. And if you simply reduce your weight by 5 to 10%, and we know this through literature, that you not only reduce your weight, you reduce your glucose, you reduce your cholesterol, and you are overall much healthier. So I think that we've given the wrong message with steers our patients away again, that you have to lose 50 pounds. No, you don't. You have to use, lose 5%. 5% of your weight, and let's just say that for a number, is uh, 10 pounds. Well, you can use that, lose that, but do it in six months. There's no quick fix. You didn't gain it overnight, and it's not going to disappear when you're sleeping. Very good point, and I, I think the Diabetes Prevention Project showed us that if you had impaired glucose not diabetic but pre-diabetic blood sugar mm -hmm. five to seven percent weight loss reduced your chance of developing diabetes by almost 60 percent over Absolutely. the next five years patients do respond to that message so i think that's an excellent it's a point. simple message and it works mm -hmm. so we're about out of time if you were going to give our audience maybe two or three pearls about where to start and let, let's assume that what your initial statement is correct that physicians aren't well versed in what to tell their patients mm -hmm. what would be the two or three things that you would tell them to start with when 
counseling patients to lose weight? I would start with finding out if they know what they eat because our patients don't realize what they eat. So I would start out with a two-day dietary recall. Have the patient write down before their visit exactly what they've eaten for two days and one weekend day also. And actually write down in the size of what you did. And then when they bring it to you, whether you're a nurse practitioner or you're a nurse in the office or yourself, is going to counsel them, well, you add up all the calories. And then you look at a chart that tells you, for instance, an average uh, 50-year-old woman normally would have 2,000 calories a day normal with normal activity of 20 to 30 minutes a day. And you find out that she's eating 3,000 calories on most days of the week. Well, there's where you're getting your weight from. And the major thing is to take a look at that list with that patient and say, what can't you live without? And so you say, okay, we'll leave that in there, but how about half of that? And then taking that diet, the things they like, the things that they're work for them and their family, and cut it down to the calories that are important. And the other message would be strong, get up and move. Great. Thank you very much. Joyce, thank you for being with us today. It's unfortunate we ran out of time. This is an important topic that we could spend a lot of time talking about. Hopefully we will again in another interview. I'm Dr. Alan Brown. You've been listening to Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Please visit ReachMD.com slash lipids, where you can listen to this podcast as well as others in this series. And please make sure to leave comments and share. We welcome your feedback. Thank you very much for listening to our show, and I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown. You've been listening to Lipid Luminations, produced in partnership with the National Lipid Association and supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. To download this program and others in this series, please visit ReachMD.com forward slash lipids. That's ReachMD.com forward slash lipids. 